All right, all right, all right, all right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello there. I'm Randall Hampton. This is Drawing Conclusions. Uh, today, I'm very fortunate. I have a special guest with me. Dr. Anthony Bean is going to come on and hang out with us. We're going to be talking about Cowboy Bebop uh, and going down a couple of uh, thematic trails with him about that. Um, uh, for everyone that's uh, new, please, you know, check us out. Uh, geeks like us, we do a lot of geeky fun things. We're, we're so, so glad to have everyone here joining us today. Uh, we're going to do some drawing and hanging out, and we're going to talk about stuff. So, uh, so sit back, relax. Chat, if you have any questions that you want to ask myself or Dr. Bean, please be as vocal as you want. We'd love to have you interacting with us while we're working today. That'd be great. Uh, Dr. Anthony Bean, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me. So if you could, please uh, tell everybody uh, out there in, uh, in Twitch land uh, who you are. What do you do? What are you about? I am a doctor of clinical psychology, and so I work uh, therapeutically with individuals across all sorts of different areas, such as autism, depression, anxiety. My specialties are geeks, gamers, and nerds, <laughs> which are hands down my favorite to work with because we get to talk about anime and stuff in, in session and then talk about all these themes. So it's going to be like, I'm just doing a session with you. It's going to be fantastic. I'll, I'll analyze you. I'll make you feel great about yourself and you're gonna just draw <laughs> and i'm just gonna sit here and draw the whole time yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so tell me a little bit so we would like in, in passing and in conversation we decided that a good topic that uh people may find interesting and that uh people of all pulp like uh around pop culture would really like would be cowboy bebop mm -hmm. first and foremost I've not seen a whole lot of Cowboy Bebop. When I heard about this, like I think I remember seeing one episode 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. Because the show's from like 1998, I think. Yeah. So, like late 90s, it's, right? It's pretty early. Okay, so I hadn't seen a whole lot. And, and in preparation for this, I got to watch a bunch of episodes of Cowboy Bebop. And holy smokes. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it very much. So... Going forward, Dr. Bean, why are we talking to you about Cowboy Bebop? Um, one, because it's an awesome anime, as we can see from my <laughs> wonderful, wonderful background as well, my virtual one. And one, the anime itself has so much amazing thematic um, apparitions that fall within it between just even the idea behind this of calling them episodes they're called sessions yeah that i mean that's to me that's a, a wonderful wonderful play on words and there's also going to be like so many different topics that could be talked about within each episode and i will be honest i think there's like two or three in the middle somewhere that are kind of like fluff when they're going down and in, into a mall to get a tape and stuff like that I consider them a little fluffy, um, but a majority of the, the anime, I think, is is hands down really great idea of, of lurching us forward on, on different aspects of one consciousness, who we are, and the heroic journey of, of Spike as we see through it. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I want to take a moment and do a shout out real quick. Dr. Cowart, thank you so much for joining us this uh, this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Wandering Shrink, and of course the people at Geeks Like Us are with us as always. Uh, Anthony, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Absolutely. Because while, while I'm drawing and while we're talking, I'm going to be a little bit distracted, so I won't be as attentive to the chat as they may need. You know, the chat, <laughs> ch chat can get needy, I understand. So if you could do it's me a favor. It's all about that Foose Road Doc. <laughs> oh, Dr. Megan, thanks so much. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, if you could, please, um, keep an eye on the chat for me. And if they have any questions or any shout outs or anything like that, go ahead and uh, have them, uh, you know, uh, be a voice for them in case I miss it. So I'd appreciate that. Um, I've discovered doing these shows, folks, that if I don't have a sketch kind of ready to go, I'm not going to get it done in that hour and a half time <laughs> time allotted. So, working up, looking up, uh, uh, working up to today's show, I went ahead and I did a little sketch real quick of uh, of two main of two big characters in the show, uh, Spike obviously, and then Vicious. So, and we're going to talk about Vicious quite a bit. I I, I have a feeling. Um, so before we get, dive into all that, give us a, a brief synopsis if you could, Anthony, about what Cowboy Bebop is. 
Absolutely. So the it's an anime series, 26 episodes long, came out in 97, ran to 98. And the whole show is the idea between bounty hunters and what they where they're going to take it uh, with their lives it's set in the future and everything. So it's, it's really kind of talking about these bounty hunters, how they are just like thrust together as a group, even though they didn't necessarily want to be with Faye Valentine, who's awesome in the show as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, Spike, who is really tr- ideally the, the main character. As, as we kind of we, when we first start with him, we really see him in the middle of what we call his heroic journey and him him coming into terms of, of what he he actually is and who he is because if if you're familiar with the the anime series itself uh you actually find out at the end where spike actually came from because you don't you don't hear about any of that in the, in the beginning couple episodes you just kind of like hey there's just this guy here and he just yeah. seems disgruntled at everything and just pissed <laughs> off at the world I, I was gonna say I noticed that very much. We didn't know a whole lot about him going forward uh, at the very beginning. You just you know mm-hmm. he's a bounty hunter. You know he's got a little bit of a chip of a, a chip on his shoulder for some reason, uh, a little edgy. Uh, and then yeah, towards the end, all of a sudden like it's information just starts flooding in. You're know, like oh oh okay, so yeah. uh, like um, so l- let's kind of let t- touch on a couple of the things that that really stuck out to me about what. Uh, cowboy bebop is kind of about and what it really uh pushes forward a couple of things that i loved about it the action the martial oh, arts yeah. the 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 choreography of the the fight scenes things like that um like you said it, this is this is almost like a mini uh outer space spaghetti western kind of thing yeah it's it, you know it was, it was one of the big themes in some um of, of animes in the in the early night early and late 90s is that uh we have um star outlaw star gun i think outlaw um or outlaw star we have trigun which are all set in like western futuristic styles yeah and like even with this one the the main story arc on on spike is is just fantastic because it it, if you if you watch a lot of anime like i do because i have to work with clients who talk about all these different ones and Yes, I've had to had to watch uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and <laughs> let me tell you, I, I don't think that that should never be your first anime you should ever do. Um, you should definitely start off with some of the more historical ones. I think that kind of get you get you to the the point of understanding what anime is. But as you as you actually go through them all, you start to see very similar characteristics across all of them, and it, and it actually puts itself into those uh, genres and, and themes in the time period that it was happening so like say in our current animes right now we have tons of medieval animes and we all with magic and sorcery and we have tons of like ai virtual reality animes so cowboy bebop itself was a a really breath of fresh air if you kind of come back to it from our current state because there isn't really anything like it right now no and i think that's one of the the main reasons that it's so beloved even my sister, who who doesn't, uh, um, what is it? Who doesn't even watch anime uh, at all? She she loves loves this series. Like she, this is the one that like you're like, oh, what anime it is? And she goes, this one. And I was like, why? She goes, the music one is fantastic. Tank is her favorite favorite um, intro intro theme. But also, it's like a whole idea between a short, it's sweet, and it's easy to digest. Not like if you go into some of the ones that go into like 800 episodes. Like it's to a point and it finalizes itself really well. I was gonna say it's 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 very much it's a contained story. It's it's mm-hmm. a contained uh, 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 this 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 nourishing bowl of oatmeal that you can eat and just in <laughs> one sit. You know what I mean? It's it's not something that's that's spanning for years and years and just eats up so much time. But at the same time, it's so satisfying. Absolutely, and I think that goes into like the the different arc. And so, like the main story arc right here is is focuses on Spike and Vicious, and you don't know about Vicious until partially through it. But you can tell that Spike's haunted by something, and that psychological impact is coming through, and that irritation. He doesn't want to be around people. He doesn't want to get close to people. And as you go through the series, you start to see a whole amazing reason why, and it's it's because of Vicious. And it, spoiler alert, but him and Vicious were teamed up on stuff in the past and you don't find that out till over halfway through. 
Now, before we get into that, let's let's go back for a minute because you 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 mentioned something earlier that I wanted to touch on and really uh, sink our teeth into too. You use the term hero's journey. Mm-hmm. So tell me in in broad terms first, what is, what how do you, how do you describe the, the a hero's journey? Well, well, we'll stick to as broad as we, we can and go into it in depth as we can, but we can literally talk for hours on, on <laughs> the, the idea of the hero's journey. So the, the whole concept of a hero's journey is the, the becoming of a hero. Okay. Now, when we start to think of, of people as, as hero, heroic or stuff like that, it's not that you are forced into that topic. It's it's a calling. It's It's something that you're you don't want to set out to be a hero. It just kind of falls on your lap. That's what makes a hero. And it's about creating the idea and the sophistication to actually knowing what that entails and where it goes. So like someone who's striving to be heroic, yeah, that's great. You're going to always be revered on some level, but will you actually attain that heroic status and, and be remembered after you leave? Probably not. And it's because you're so, the best heroes are the ones that have destiny thrust upon them and not the ones that are necessarily looking for it. Because usually when you look for it, you cause a big reaction and a big negativity in the world around you that causes a, a dystopian type life where you view yourself as the heroic endeavor that's happening in the story arc. But in reality, you're actually playing that villain, that uh, that archaic uh, demon-like soul that is just going to destroy everything. So when... Go on. No, no, no. Go ahead. I'll come I was going to say. So when we when we first start the series, we see Spike actually in what we call in kind of the, the middle of the heroic journey um, is because he he's trying to push away from it. He's saying, "I don't want this. This is not me. I want to forget. I have just one mission left in life. I don't want to be a hero. I'm not here to save anybody." And then that's what we call is the calling is that he's forced into this because as you go through the series, you start to see that the calling is shaping him for a a one-on-one face-off against vicious in the end and with that one-on-one face-off he is thrust into it he doesn't have a choice all roads lead to this and so when we talk about the heroic journey the the hero itself is always one that is trying to push off this duty like i don't want to be this this isn't me i i i renounce this this style of being. And we start to see this a little bit more in recent anime styles, although some of them haven't uh, gone this route and kind of come with like what we call an OP character. And that OP character (laughs) is just like, oh yeah, you know, I know I'm strong, but I don't know how strong I am. Okay, wait, wait, I'm sorry. When we say OP, are we talking like OP as in overpowered? Yes. OP as in like... uh, uh, Overpowered. Okay, not as in like the Andy Griffith show. Yeah, not, not like the Andy Griffith show. Okay. <laughs> For a second, it's I was a, like, wait, Opie? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think that one of the, one of the big key importance of, of Spike is that he has to complete the journey. And there's no way around it. All Again, all roads lead to it. And he can refuse the call. He has to go into his own, what we would call subconscious, his own uh, demonized soul portion of himself, collective unconscious, shadow work. And you can actually see his shadow work progress through the middle ch- uh, middle sessions. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of like point out that title is those things. It's almost like you're seeing an auto diary of, of Spike through this and at the end of it. And you're watching it through, through his eyes and he's telling the story almost like he has survived, again, spoiler, um, that he has survived the ending portion overall. I'm going to say this. We're going to talk some spoilers on this show, and it's been around since yeah. 1998. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I mean, go go watch it, absolutely. I, I this, this week was the first opportunity I've had to watch it, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. So, And I'm not an anime. I'm not a huge anime fan. Like, I, like I've never really been a guy that do, do, dived into anime as... as uh, voraciously as some other people. Like, when I, was, when I was growing up, anime wasn't huge. I think when I was in high school... Uh, Toonami on Cartoon Network was just kind of coming mm-hmm. around. So like Dragon Ball Z kind of stuff. That that that's like the first uh, introduction I had to, to four episodes to... of the same fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. And this is completely different. That's mm-hmm. what I and and that's that, going back to your other point that because this is a contained thing. This was this was so much more satisfying 
than 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 what I watched in Dragon Ball Z. And Dragon Ball Z was fun, and it was you know it was it was whimsical and it was entertaining, and still tons of violence for kids to watch, and that's great. Um, but this one was there was there was so much more depth to it I, yeah. that I really enjoyed. Um, we talked about how it's 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 set in this this spaghetti western outer space opera kind of thing. Uh, it, it's got this dystopian future going on like like i remember seeing a couple episodes where they went to earth and it was just landfill after landfill and uh, submerged malls. submerged cities yeah. yeah and all kinds of crazy things that you look at and you're like oh yeah that's i can i can see that now <laughs> it, it's it's kind of like when the the idea of uh when we when we enter space and this is actually in a lot of different styles of anime is when we enter space there is no law in space like it's not like the it's the it's idea wild of west. it's it is a wild west which is why that theme comes out so well in yeah, uh, some absolutely. of these space ex- exploration ones absolutely. and and those those that type of theme is so so interesting because it has such a massive ring of truth to it that when we eventually enter space and we go from planet to planet who's guarding that line in between these planets that are star- light years away you know, like who's going to be there to, to save you? Are we going to have a military that's made up of billions upon billions of people? Like, where is this going to go? Yeah, it was. Uh, there, there was one episode that that I watched that had the um, I don't remember. I don't remember the term they used, but basically they used the virtual reality uh, video game to get to basically. I don't know if you want to call it mind white people or whatever, but basically transfer their consciousness into mm-hmm. an electronic system. Uh, because uh, one of the reasons was because you know society was going from planet to planet, basically stripping these planets of their resources and then moving on and expanding and colonizing. So, you know, why is that something that we feel the need to do? Why is that? Why is that such a rampant? The idea of capitalism being so so uh, 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 rampant and taking over society and what we're doing and stuff. So different things like that that kept coming up was great. Absolutely. And I think that one of the the ideas that that comes through is it, it's really really lawless, and yeah. and the the idea of the syndicate as it came through, um, of how it's just like mafia, like there there's no one to patrol this stuff, and there's no one that's going to be able to patrol, it. and it kind of comes in Outlaw Star and all of the other ones too. Is just there's n- there's no way to, to police this stuff unless you're near one of the main homeworld planets. It was so funny when I first saw the, um, the like the commercial for the bounty hunters, with the uh, the two cowboys and the and the the music that played mm-hmm. in the background that bam ding 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 yep. ding, 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 ding ding like it took me back uh, like I remember that's the music in Suikoden I think it was mm-hmm. the very beginning with the with the, the the little cup game yeah and and I was like wait what is that like I had to, like I was working and I and I heard it I had the the show playing in the background and I was like wait what <laughs> absolutely and it just emerges everything so beautifully it's yeah. it's one of the the ideas that the music of the the anime helps portray that scene it helps bring it to life in a different a different aspect almost and it like I think that having this this show is kind of like what we'd call is that that it's a hybrid of so many different thematic uh bits like it's just, it's so dark and gritty like it, it, we would even say like it in the idea of comics at that point it, it, le- it was leading the charge in anime where comics was coming from from like that dark uh noir uh, style point of uh of, pre- of being uh, well uh, western pulp fiction dark gritty destruction no one knows you're dead until months later when you haven't returned anywhere no one's heard from you you then you just assume dead syndicates ex- exist where they're just assassins and they just if they don't like you they go out and kill you and they're literally working everything from planets to corporations to to manipulate it into their their favor and they're just downright dirty <laughs> dirty nasty people that uh have pretty much all the power and all the money and all of the cosmos and just continue to to utilize it to keep themselves in power so let's talk about let's talk about spike let's talk about why spike is the hero in this in this story spike is hands down the hero because we start to see his his endeavors come to come to light going through the the actual storyline so the the whole 
show itself while it has its other cast of characters such as like Faye Valentine and, and Jet and Einstein um, and Ein as well, that all of them all circle around what is Spike doing? Like even Jet who, who knows that he's like, I want you off my ship. I don't want to ever see you again. You get out of here. Don't ever come back. He always comes back for Spike. So Ed, the entire uh, Cosmo of this this club, this these four people plus Dog, Corgi, and um, all circles around uh, Spike and, and all of his in, in, endeavor, in, endeavors and everything else that he's going forward. So with, with that, it's really, really kind of interesting to see where he comes from because like we said already in the beginning you don't know anything about him you just see no. this disgruntled guy and you just see him pissing off everyone around him he just doesn't care he doesn't want people to get close but as you go through it you learn more about him and it actually humanizes him and it actually makes him like oh this makes sense why he doesn't want to get close to people he lost someone he lost julia the the love of his life and lost her too vicious to to something else to someone who he thought he was his deep friend because as we find out through the series spike was part of a syndicate part of this type of uh, ideal and with with him and vicious were they were like the two most deadly assassins in the known universe and the death of julia is what split them apart and when we go through that it's it's we're really looking at his redemption his aspect of of who he is and that that calling that he has to finish what has started like he knows that vicious is the enemy but he's he's trying to run away from it and just be a bounty hunter no name bounty hunter but even though he has a pretty decent name and then he he gets thrust into that destiny and just keeps on calling he tries to run away something reminds him he has a flashback or he meets someone from his past and you guys learn about him and and where he kind of comes from and where he goes with this type of information i mean it's just absolutely phenomenal where he he, he starts from and where he where you guys where we as the the, the people coming in see him but also where he goes at the end So, we, we you're you're talking about the, about about his change over the end. Like I remember when I mm -hmm. first started watching, and we're gonna so we're gonna basically talk about how Spike changes now. I remember at the very beginning of the of the series when I started watching, he's he's cold. He doesn't really. He's he's just about getting the job done, making his paycheck, making sure there's food to eat on the ship. That was that was it. Um, and he also doesn't really care whether he lives or dies. Okay. That that's another big theme. It's like okay. he, he he is what when you say like he gets the job done, he doesn't care if he doesn't come back because the job will be done. But he he thrusts himself into these super dangerous situations where he doesn't um, have to um, kind of understand where where he's coming from. In the, the they're saying that you're a little little quiet there randall as well oh i'm a little quiet all right sorry about that i'll move my i'm trying not to breathe right into my mic um <sighs> sorry um, it, all so, right yeah so we, i mean we, <laughs> we are um definitely uh going down that that transformational path where he he doesn't have a reason to exist he doesn't have anything going on um at all that he he really cares about until you start seeing these semblances of his personality to start coming out in in different actions that he does he's like oh well i am gonna save us because normal spike i feel like if we had seen him like a year before like the first uh one of the first episodes where he's trying to save people from being turned into genetic uh monkeys yeah uh, or gorillas he would have been like i don't really care just let it go but he actually puts forth the endeavor at the end. He's like, crap, I'm going to actually have to save these people. And I think that's where he starts to get his sense of, of who he was coming back, where he's like, oh, I'm not just murdering and killing people anymore. I can actually save people. And I think that's where we start to see a change in his behavior and his cognitions and his ability to, to kind of go forward and start moving past uh, his past. So what, so what, what is the spark for that? Cause you know what you like normally you say he just he doesn't care if he gets the job done or not. He'll just go out and do it. If he dies, he dies, whatever. If he gets paid, great, next job. So what is it that changes it from 
like you said, uh, you know, he's able to help these people. Is there something like that happens in the series that really, you know, lights that fuse? Is it the people around him? Is it? I think it's a mix of the the people around him, but it's also his impulsivity in nature. Um, okay. Is that his his ability to like he he could have just like stopped and watched some of these things happen, but he was like, nope, can't do it. And he just like sprung to action, and I think that impulsivity is is very helpful, and that's also one of the the hallmark characteristics of being a hero. Okay. You don't think, you don't think before you act. You just act. In a sense, you're not like weighing the danger, calculating those types of things, and and then running in. It's like you you just go. Like My Hero Academia, one of the things with uh, Midoriya is he just acts, and that's really what takes into uh, a heroic, uh, charismatic uh, ability and in typology to to be who, who one is in that, that aspect. It's just it's what comprises it. And I think that's where we start seeing the turning point because that impulsivity had always been used for something else in the past. And now it's being used to, to help good. And I think by having that good be helped, he, he feels like he can, he feels empowered almost to, to feel like he can get something done. He can change this is the way that he's doing something. Okay. How is our chat doing? Pretty good. The uh, Fusro doc is like, sounds like Midori in season one. And you're correct. It, except then obviously with My Hero Academia, we're, we're going to see that one not be so self-contained, I think. I think we'll probably see that one go on for anywhere from five to ten seasons versus this one is just kind of what we talked about. It's like just a beautifully kept storyline within 26 episodes. It hits all the marks that we kind of needed to hit to, to feel that that pull to it. Now, and it's interesting because, like, the idea of the hero, the hero would never want to be in the situation. Like you, like you touched on this before, the hero doesn't want to be in the situation where they have to put their lives in danger. You know, they're the ones that they they. they I mean, usually in this case, it's different. I mean, uh, they're, they're not the ones that are going out, like you said, going out looking for danger. They're not looking for, for a reason to they're, – they, they're the ones that, that, that feel the pull at certain points in their lives. And that's what triggers them and forces them into the role. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we've got that with, with Spike. Um, uh, let's see. Where was I going to go with this? I had a thought. <laughs> and then it just left. They just it out. It just flitted out. It just went away. Um, okay. <laughs> it just went bye bye. Um, I'm just I'm trying to think of some other uh, other heroes and, and things that I've seen in other pop culture uh, 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 pop culture IPs and things like like I know that you guys have that, that you have a, a, a deft hand, a, a hefty hand in the uh, the Zelda series mm-hmm. and uh, and and. The hero's journey with Link, and how even in in some cases it, it doesn't seem like he should be the person, but he's the hero of destiny. He's always the one that ends up coming back, um, yeah. and cool. thrust into that destiny. Like okay. we, let's be very clear, he doesn't have a choice. He's thrust into it. Uh, Link's Link's awakening, uh, just thrown into it. With through all of the other the other aspects of of that game and other games as well, that, that's one of the reasons why usually these these types of series resonates us with so much. With uh, Naruto, he's an ADHD kid. He he literally is so impulsive, but he's also um, it's one of the the greatest things I think I've, I've ever heard Dr. Ryan Kelly say is that his persistence is his best weapon. His ability to not give up, to continue to better himself going forward, whereas other people who are um, fine with where they're at, we we type to see that that pull, that that change, and that's why we resonate with these characters. And I think we do that with Spike because we see it um, a part of him in us. He's a little bit of an anti-hero at the beginning, though, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And we, and we talked about that with with uh, with Ryan as well. Um, the anti-hero isn't really someone that we aspire to be. Is it is it yeah. is it is it the transition that we see in him that that appeals to us that he goes from being the antihero to being someone that is genuinely concerned for the welfare of others? I mean, because we all like to think that we're that we that we we have others' interest in you know in mind. I mean, is that is that something that really is that what boils in us? Is, is... well, I mean, I don't I don't know if, if Spike ever really got out of the the idea of the antihero. 
um, okay. even throughout through the rest of it that he whenever we whenever heroes kind of came into play through like comics and stories and stuff like that we always see them as coming like you know captain america righteous morally um correct and everything along those lines mm -hmm. when when in fact that's not really what heroes are like that's what people aspire to be but no one really comes from a, a batman style uh portrayal of, of being able to to say like i have all this money and i'm going to go do all these things uh we we really have to to look at it from a, a different perspective and while those are what we aspire to be those characters aren't always relatable and i think that's where spike comes in because we've we've all been down at the dumps we've all been having these these types of issues we've all gone in and had problems when we when we've done a, a problematic behavior or a decision that's caused just distress or stress to someone else and so when that that i think is one of the reasons why we see spike so relatable because we see parts of ourselves within him but that anti-hero quality of him i don't see the him getting kind of out of it um overall or being able to to do it because at the end he still has that one drive to go after vicious but he he does it in a way that he's trying to on his path towards annihilation um, with the with the yin and yang aspect, we'll talk about later. That there is that that possibility where he is going to try to do everything he can in the vicinity for his people, but he's not going to go out of his way to search the stars like Captain Marvel style for justice. So let, let's talk about the people around him then. Let's talk about let's talk about Jet his uh his co-pilot or the captain of the ship whatever you want to call him captain um, of bebop cap captain of bebop so you got jet <laughs> um faye who really just stumbled into the group um uh, and uh and and ed and then einstein mm -hmm. so let's talk about them those four characters how like like i'd love to see how you see each character really having their influence on on spike as the series moves on and what and how they help drive him in that hero's journey. Absolutely. So I, I would probably say that Jet himself is, is kind of what we call that, uh, that far, father archetype for, for Spike, where he doesn't necessarily feel like he ever had anything from his parents. It's probably why he got drafted into the, the syndicate in the beginning. Um, but Jet comes out of nowhere and kind of acts as that fatherly figure, but not overly fatherly. Like, Hey, I am your, your, brother in arms style but i'm also going to be like you shouldn't do that that's just stupid use your head spike <laughs> as he would probably say and, and then uh, he that's kind of the, the role that he plays in that aspect he's always pulling spike out of the fire he's always giving spike extra chances because he knows spikes has a, a past that can't really be talked about quite yet and then you're right faye valentine just comes out of nowhere she's another bounty hunter who's just out for guts and glory and then falls into these uh, with the, this whole entrapment of a uh, of style of, of like, these people are interesting. They, they don't judge me. Like she, she obviously has given off that, that feel that um, just cause she's a woman, she can't be a bounty hunter and other aspects of her, her past have always uh, haunted her. But when she meets these, these other two, they, they don't judge her. They sometimes see her as a nuisance because sometimes she acts like a nuisance, but so does all the rest of the characters, especially Spike but they accept her for who she is and what she's doing. And I think that in itself is the reason that she stays. And then we have Ed, who is literally just someone who is maintaining the ship, just loving life of what she's doing, and then has her dog that's just running around keeping her company. Almost like uh, we, we kind of have a little bit of a, a, a beginning stages of a, an Aspie character um, coming on in to with, uh, with Ed. Mm -hmm. So like, I think that the reason that all of those ones play so well together is because they act as what we call uh, projections of of what uh, of what um, what Spike can be and and could accomplish, and like they become a family to him. So that that I think when it was just him and Jet, it didn't necessarily hit as much. If that makes sense, it didn't like feel as much as as a family. It felt more of that father son relationship. But then we bring in Faye, who traverses that mother archetype versus the 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 sister sibling archetype. And then we have Ed, who is just a loose cannon at some times, <laughs> and, and then just like, oh, this blew up. I'll fix it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and run and running around. Um, 
So I think that he has this this aspect, this uh, aspiration that this this cohesion is something that he wants to protect, and it's almost like a family that uh, rivals what he had with uh, Julia. And, and it's sad that there's not a whole lot more about his backstory throughout the sto- but throughout the show, mm-hmm. because there are, there are parts where I where I'm thinking, oh man, I would love to have actually seen more about you know, uh, his life with Julia. I'd like to see more about, you know, how he interacted with, with vicious. And this actually is a good segue into that too, because there's definitely a dividing line between the two of them, but they were with each other for so long and they were partners for so long that there had to have been, I don't want to see like, like a, a, a source, a set, a, a, like an osmosis between them where, where personalities co-mingled and, and, and they fed off of one another. Yeah. Then, then there's a dividing line and something happens and it breaks. So where and how, where or how do we see and acknowledge like that, that difference between spike and vicious, you know, where does that, where does that come up and, and how does that play into that yin yang that you were speaking of earlier? Absolutely. So uh, the the point of what we're talking about with Vicious and Spike is actually when Julia dies, and that's death by, in, in essence, uh, Vicious's hand. So what we kind of see is that uh, that dividing line be- behind Spike and, and Vicious, where Spike, and when they were part of the sy- syndicate, they, like I said before, they are were like an inseparable duo. They they were the leaders. If, if someone needed to be killed and they not wanted to make sure it was done, they sent these two because nothing could stop them. Um, they had range, they had in, in, in blade attack and, and everything along those lines. It was absolutely phenomenal to see them working as a group. But then Julia got in the way. And Julia was that dividing line where it was kind of changing Spike a little bit to, to possibly get out of the syndicate, to possibly change. And Vicious was not having any of that, wanted to keep on going the same because he liked what he was doing. Then we have that that death, that aspect of of who they are and and the the death is really that that pulling away that line that spike was not willing to cross any longer and that's where we saw that that big old yin yang where we, we saw them instead of them working in harmony together they actually split apart a little bit more and when we're talking about the yin yang we are talking about the the light and the dark and how the dark and the light are within each dark and light as well so they're they're mixing and they, they form a cohesive soul now the the wonderful thing about the spike and vicious is that they are a perfect illusion to yin and yang where one super dark vicious where he will just kill without remorse doesn't care what happens to other people he's literally the the embodiment of evil uh, and darkness on something then we also have spike who is what we call the embodiment of, of light of uh, the ability to kind of come forward uh overall and he is able to to utilize that to his benefit and i think that's where we start seeing again that that change but the wonderful thing about this types of of, of viewing this uh i'll use the word um religion style of taoism or anything along those lines that they cannot exist without one another you cannot have a light or dark without being able to appropriately contrast it with the other that's also when it comes back to like the legend of zelda that um the the idea is that let's say if if link loses and it gets thrust into the dark world that you actually have to recognize that if no, if there isn't a hero battling back against it, then that evil is considered to be what is normal, and there's no contrast to to push it up against mm. something else. So if it's normal, then that's all that exists. There, there's not a way to contrast it. Now, when you have that contrasting factor, and you are becoming that in Legend of Zelda, you are becoming the light, the light that is shining, so people can then actually see that the evil is happening out there and, and showing that, hey, these people are not the, not really great great ideas, not great people. You are just quoting Breath of the Wild right there. 
I'm quoting all, all the Legend of Zelda's <laughs> on this one. Um, but what, what we see is Spike and, and Fish is just, one cannot exist without the other. Like the, the whole idea yeah. behind yin and yang is, is the same, works the same way for, for good. You can't tell if something's good or not without being able to contrast it against evil or darkness. They, you, there's, there's no way to philosophically or metaphorically even compare them without having both of them exist. So as one gets destroyed, so does the other. And in this case, we tend to see uh, when there's a destruction, one's, one goes, so, so does the other, literally and metaphorically. Yeah. They both cancel each other out and they both kill each other. Therefore, it doesn't exist anymore. So there's this ultimate sacrifice almost to, to bring an end to Vicious is, is Spike's own sacrifice of his life. Through the window in the bay, even back of my, uh, my uh, uh, screen right now, is that's the window that they jump out and they're, they're fighting through it. How is the chat doing? I've swapped a <laughs> oh, uh, Meg. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> uh, let's see. Fusro Doc is still here, stirring up trouble. I see. Every day. Every day, all the time. Okay. That's why we like him. So like when we're when we're talking about these these different uh, aspects of, of who we are and what we're doing, this is why we we can relate to these characters because we all have that dark side within us. We all have that light side. It's it's not necessarily a matter of us trying to say we don't have them or what we can do with it or what we can't do with it. It's how do we use it? What is the aspect that we we utilize within it? How do our decisions define us? And, I think that was one of the reasons why Spike had such a hard time. He has a hard time because he felt like he was defined by his past decisions. Yeah, you mentioned that also before. You know, he kept he keeps running from his past. He wants to like bury it. He doesn't want it to be um, uh, a part of who he is. Mm -hmm. Is there is there something in that to that with him? Is the the confrontation with Vicious is that him? confronting his past is that him just finally accepting it and 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 getting some closure with it i mean it's the ultimate closure really but uh but i mean is that is is that the the uh what's going through his head at that point is that he just is that the only way he can can redeem himself or come to terms with what he's done well with with the uh, the idea of cautious thought it's it's unclear it'll always be unclear of sure. what what he is he's doing in that that aspect sure. but vicious in itself never strayed from the path that uh, spike left and so vicious is the embodiment of his past of his past existence his past experiences his past being of of life and when it is that way and he confronts it of course it's going to definitely um be a, a major confrontation because he's no longer that type of person and so he knows that in order for it to, to finally destroy that because vicious is trying to pull him back into this lifestyle um at the end on some level and if he can't do it then he need he knows he needs to destroy spike because spike is a threat yeah, but if, if he can pull spike in then spike's no longer that that threatening uh posture that threatening ability anymore it's it is one of the things I think that defines these these characters and the the overall arc of the storyline. And so, by him taking on Vicious, it is a, a form of redemption. And if we even look at this this style of of artwork that I have in, in my thing right here, we can actually see that Spike technically has the upper hand right now. Um, and the reason he has the upper hand is because his gun's actually pointed at Vicious's heart versus Vicious would just puncture a bomb. <laughs> Spike can live through that, um, but, he, but Vicious can't live through, a, obviously, a shot in the heart. But so by him taking on Vicious at the end, he is encompassing everything about that, uh, recoming back to who he was, reclaiming himself and destroying his, attempting to destroy his past because if you watch the series, the vicious actually kind of like murders the entire heads of the syndicate and becomes the, the leader of it. Yep. And 
And with that, if, if Vicious goes, then the syndicate falls in disarray. And that disarray is going to take years to re, recombine and, and re-get back up. And so if, if Spike takes out Vicious, it's a two-hit punch. It's the destruction of, of evil, the head of the syndicate, but it's also the destruction of, uh, of a major power that's enforcing in and creating havoc throughout all of the, the different universe, known universe at the moment. It seems to me that, yes, he is – and this is just one point of view, and I'm just going to spit it out because it just popped into my brain. It seems to me that, yes, uh, Spike is on that, that hero's path, but at the same time, I don't necessarily know that in his mind he was thinking about the good of the universe or the good of the, of the, of the, the galaxy mm-hmm. in regards to the, to the syndicate when he went in for that final duel with, with Vicious. It was still a very personal thing. Oh, it's super personal. Like, I, I think that's one of the, that would be what we'd call like the, the fallout of the battle itself sure. is that he, he's not necessarily thinking like, oh, if I get rid of Vicious, I'm going to save the universe. He, he doesn't care enough about the universe. <laughs> okay. It, even, even at this point, I don't think that he, he understands it. He, he, that personal grudge is always going to, to kind of be there. It's going to be that chip in the shoulder that drives him. And that that aspect in itself is really what pushes him into this, this final confrontation is he doesn't care whether the syndicate stays or falls. His main objective is to get rid of, of vicious and because that is his redemption story. But I think that you bring up a good point is that he doesn't necessarily care what happens at the end. It doesn't matter to him because he's going to just keep on going if he's, if he survives and it just, it doesn't matter what happens because he knows he can just keep on surviving out there. He does not thinking of like, Oh, these 15 billion planets are, that are surviving off everything won't be under syndicate control. He doesn't care. <laughs> he just doesn't care. He's not thinking that far. That's a major fallout of like uh, the the idea of Rome falling and in the whole country slowly falling out like uh, dominoes the past that. He's not thinking about that aspect. Yeah. It, the, the other thing that, that stuck with me is it, the, the walk up to the final confrontation. Um, Ed leaves with Aini. Mm-hmm. Faye is still on board and she basically tells him, don't go. You mm-hmm. know, she's, she's begging him. She's saying, stay here. You have a family here now, whatever. And, and, and he just doesn't seem put off by any of that. He's just like, you know, no, I've got this, this one track mind. I've got something that I need to do. I'm very driven by it. And he just, he, it, it's even as the hero and maybe as you want to call him the antihero, he's so dismissive to, the positive influences in his life that he has mm-hmm. is that is that fair i, mean, I think it's, it's super fair that i think that with with his aspect in where he's coming from he doesn't necessarily understand or if he does understand he doesn't necessarily put it the same emphasis of importance upon those aspects as other people do and the reason is because he knows that if he walks away from this, if he turns his back, mm-hmm. one, Vicious will always be there. And Vicious will sure. never stop. And Vicious, I guess is his name, will go and kill all these people one by one. And so he will lose more loved ones. And it will hurt the same way as it hurts a Ju- like hurt him with Julia's death. And so for him to, to go into that aspect, he can't handle another uh, close one being done. So he is willing to sacrifice himself because he knows Vicious will not stop until until okay. he gets to the end of it. Okay. So the, the, the idea of self-sacrifice is absolutely uh, uh, synonymous or, or a part of the hero stigma. Um, you know, the, the, like... It is a stigma. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, like, the, 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 the idea of the hero is always the, the person that jumps on the grenade, so the person that, you know, lays on the barbed wire so the next person can get high, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. You know, they're the ones that are willing to make the sacrifice so for the, for the greater good. And even though, you know, he doesn't necessarily care about the universe or all that, I guess, I guess it does show that maybe he does care about, you know, those two or three people, mm-hmm. you know? Because so, so, you said it perfectly, I think, with Faye saying, like, you have a family style here. Like, this is a cohesiveness. And he's he, almost in a sense, he doesn't want to acknowledge it because then it gives Faye more ammo. But he acknowledges it by sacrificing himself for, sure. the, for the sake of them. All right. People in the chat, how, how many of you have, have, watched, uh, have watched Cowboy Bebop? 
and have fallen in love with it for other than the music because the music is the first thing that caught me right off the bat the music in this show is amazing i enjoyed it so much um so i want to know is there wh- who, who out there has watched this and and has felt uh, uh similar to us because anthony dr anthony here definitely has definitely has uh um Oh, I have a very soft, I have a very soft spot for this anime. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why we, that's why we asked you to come on here and talk with us about it. Um, Yeah. So I want to know, I mean, what, what, what is it? And and in regards, are there other, are there other uh, properties that, that really speak to the idea of the hero's journey? And, and, and I know there are, but that have taken such radically different takes you know, like the, where there's there there are heroes that may 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 be forced into it, but at the same time, maybe they were always there. Like like for me, I'm thinking of like like going into like video games and things. I think of like um, like in Mass Effect, mm-hmm. Commander Shepard, he's always the hero, or he or she is always the hero, always has been, depending on your the the backgrounds that you choose and things like that. And they just continue to build on that and build on that. Mm-hmm. And the journey is kind of always is it, it, it's not so much a, much of a of a journey there it's just a state of being at that point <laughs> well i mean as a character your character you're playing through that 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 one you're you're becoming you're making shepherd into the the heroic endeavor that he actually is and if that's one of the i think the aspects of of the show of that in a, not in, I mean, that video game itself that actually people can can help manage and can kind of uh, understand themselves a little bit more because they're their embodiment of the hero. Sure. And it's, so I think that like kind of, this kind of goes back to the idea of, like I, I truly believe like most if not all video games forces you into a, a start at the beginning of what we call it like an orphan archetype. You are thrust out of everything. You uh, you've been lied to, stole to, anything. You've been like drugged dregs of society you've been destroyed put back together you're now considered an enemy somewhere there's a whole bunch of different ways to to be viewed as the as the orphan spike in this case orphans himself away from everybody else by leaving the syndicate he literally puts a death warrant on his on his head and with that death warrant he um he has officially uh, continue to orphan himself throughout everything and by creating the family through Jet, Faye, Ed, and, and Ayn, that is no longer uh, an aspect of it, but he has to come to terms with the rest of what it means to be the, the, the hero in, in culminating this past overall with that. So I think that with this this orphan stuff is we can relate to, to Spike to feel like we've been ostracized, put out, we've been there's something bigger than ourselves that we have to overcome, whether it's uh, whether it's a trauma, whether it's a, a big project, whether it's it's a book we're writing or maybe it's a school project. We, we don't know what it is, but all of these things can be pulled out of these types of anime styles into a, what we call a metaphorical lens and really see why we're drawn to, to certain aspects of cer- certain shows. Uh, I can say, for, for instance, I have uh, some kids who like certain animes, like I have one girl who likes bungo stray dogs i can't tell you why it's not my anime but i I watch it specifically to talk with her about it she loves that one i'm like all right we're cool let's let's make this happen and she pulls up uh different elements of the show and relates it to who who she is and when she's she can't then that's when she comes to to, comes to me and we kind of like talk about it a little bit like she's used um she's very socially anxious and socially awkward and so when she goes and talks about these types of, of aspects and these types of beings that when she is thrust into a group where she feels like she doesn't know anybody and she doesn't has never interacted with these people the halt the fallback that we always go with is well which anime characters do they remind you of and then she identifies them from different animes it doesn't have to be from the same anime and then we talk about how do those personalities that they represent they portray towards us in the real world kind of interact with um, what the project is and how we have to then relate and interact with them. Because if you know what to expect from someone else, then in like that, by based on their personality, you then know what to expect going forward or have a good idea. Then you can interact with them safely in a safe environment. 
the now the idea of the hero is 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 absolutely something that we all cling on to in terms of entertainment value. You know, when we play a video game, when we watch an anime, when we read a book, when we see a movie, the heroes are always the people that we cling on to and we want to see them succeed. We want to see them get their happy ending. Um, is that uh, when when I mean, is that is that is that a, a valid uh, way to really uh, a, a valid type of escapism for us? Speaking in a broad sense. Very mm-hmm. broad sense. Um, you know, we have our troubles every day. We have the things that I mean. Can we, can we look at these heroes and and take from them and and grow and and use and really um, uh, uh, use those experiences that they have to help us? I mean, how does that? How do, how can we? Other than just sheer entertainment value. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're they're definitely super entertaining. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that the it kind of goes back to the what we talked a little bit earlier is that when we when we have these these heroic uh, journeys, they always started off when first came out like comic books of these pristine characters and that they had nothing wrong with them. Yeah. And then one of the biggest things that kind of happened with that is they they got grittier, more relatable because people started started realizing that we don't relate to a pristine none of us are perfect none of us are are in this this aspect that we we feel like we are safe and we we have no shame or nothing bad in our in our histories and so with that aspect of the by relating to these these types of characters it's not just the entertainment value because there's animes out there I could care less for. Like I've, I've watched a, a couple of them. I got through halfway through the first episode. I'm like, nah, this is not no. mine. I don't really care for this. Like Tokyo ghoul. I watched the first six episodes of that and I was like, I'm good. This doesn't caught my attention. <laughs> and it, it, it's honestly because the, the main character is just a whiny little bitch, but, um, and it's just like, dude, this happened. Move on. You've got to use it, use it to your, your benefit. And I, I get, keep on getting told by my kids who watch anime, um, they talk about it. It's it better in season two, and I'm like, well, I can't get to season two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the there, issue. If you can't get it, there, is it really that? Is it really worth it? Yeah, it's 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 not. <laughs> um, so I think that when when we talk about these these different aspects and these different uh, archetypal heroic journeys, that we could uh, we we pull these different aspects of who we are because we we sometimes need that that heroic journey to. Uh, to overcome something, a project that we're doing. Like whenever I start talking with parents and it's in a couple books of, of mine and chapters is parenting itself is a heroic task. Um, it takes massive amount of energy and it is something that is not easily done and is not for the faint hearted. <laughs> I, I can tell you uh, at three three and a half years my kid i've cleaned poop off of walls <laughs> i've cleaned poop out of places i never thought i would and i don't know if i ever want to do that again that but takes from, a special kind of patience yeah oh it always sure does because god normally i don't even like that crap um huh, so um stuff like that but it's 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 one of the things is uh it, it takes heroic energy to complete something to get through your finals to get through uh your day to maybe your parents are are fighting or something like that it's over something stupid you don't want to listen to it anime is a wonderful escapism to be like "Ah, let me get into something more powerful than i am and how how what am i pulling out of it that that in itself is, is super super important okay so it is still it's still it's still uh an option and a viable escape to, regardless of what's going on, you, you can always re- re- retreat to these, these, uh, these IPs, these, these pop culture, these fantasy phenomena, worlds, these fantasy worlds. Exactly, mm-hmm. that's a very good word, term for it. That uh, and and just and and take a breath. Yeah, it really is one of the the aspects that these the different animes in itself give us, and I think that's one of the reasons why when we we have such a a visceral reaction to let's let's say like um comic book some people in the comic book uh, who really like uh, the theory of of uh, heroic characters in in the books in comics and stuff like that they see it through like marvel's thors and avengers and 
they they're like this isn't always true to the storyline like and they get really upset and they get sure. upset because okay. they have this this idea of of who this person is and where they're going to go and what they do and that upsetness is because it rattles their world their perception of that and i think that's what we're probably going to see we see it with everything we saw it with bleaches um uh, reboot of it but we're also going to probably see it with um i think netflix is a reboot of of the uh or not reboot of, of actually making a live action of this of cowboy bebop yeah oh yeah there's there's a lot of uh uh new stuff coming out that i'm uh, excited for and scared for at the same time <laughs> the, the idea the the new uh airbender series coming out has yep. has me a little apprehensive um uh the, this new the okay i'm a fan of cowboy bebop now like mm-hmm. I, I i had I, I dipped my toe before and this week i took a little bit of a plunge and it was that being shoved off you know shoved off the pier into the water into this what this series is this is really what did it for me and that really really um i enjoyed it so now i'm excited about the idea of a live yeah. action uh, a, a version of this. My fear is whenever they take whenever they take an animated uh, IP and then try and make it live action, the first thing I always ask is why, because you can never do it as good as mm-hmm. you can in in animation. Because animation, there's absolutely no boundaries. No no, no rules on there's that. No Anything rules. goes. There's no boundaries. You can do whatever you want, and and then you know to to try and give it the 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 tactile feel of a real world can just ruin the magic of it and that scares me <laughs> <laughs> i think it scares a lot of us that and i think a lot of me. us a lot of us felt that way with the the bleach one now i didn't think it was as bad as a lot of people did is it as great no okay. but it was it was it was a lot better than some of the other stuff that's come out that i can say so talk to me, we've talked on at, at, at nauseum about um, about uh, Cowboy Bebop, and we all love Cowboy Bebop here now. Now mm-hmm. you better, otherwise get out. Get out. Um, <laughs> what are what are let, let's 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 keep the the focus. We can we can steer away from Cowboy Bebop as I'm finishing the picture. Mm-hmm. But let's talk. It's looking about, great too, by the way. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about the idea of the hero still. Let's continue on that train because that's actually that's one that's the theme of this story that I really enjoy and and knowing that that's what we were going to talk about with that I kind of kept that in the back of my mind as I was watching it and as I was watching it I was like this guy's not a freaking hero what's going on and then I watched more and I was like okay, okay. all right we're mm-hmm. getting there we're getting there we're getting there and it's good let's go somewhere else outside of Cowboy Bebop what are some of the great hero stories for you like the ones that really inspire Ooh. you. Uh, and really, and the ones that you can always go back to, and I'm going to say you can't use Legend of Zelda. Hey, that would be the immediate one that I would obviously gonna, I, go to. I know you're going to say Legend yeah, of Zelda. Yeah, you know so I was going to gonna some, say let's, that. Let's, let's let's pick out something else. So I like the the idea of uh, Terry Brooks's novels actually, and uh, this is the Sword of Shannara series. Okay. And uh, the reason is it's because it's a mix of magic and technology, and they're oh. always at odds and within each other. And there's always destruction, and, and each uh, series, always a three book series, um, puts on a new set of heroes. And whereas they they're thrust into their destinies and stuff like that, to me it's it's like really interesting fantasy that to me never gets old because you're just like, oh great, this is fantastic. <laughs> But if we were going to go into into different shows and stuff, I don't know if I could pick anything because I, I generally will will watch anime at at night while my wife's doing other stuff and pick out certain things. So like I just recently saw a plunder, the anime plunder, which is still releasing new episodes right now uh, this season. It probably will put an end to it for a little bit. And it's a very interesting uh, aspect uh, to to the anime because it's uh, it's a guy who's trying to do something very similar to Redemption that Spike's doing here, and to so to me it's like going through a genre or a video game or something like that is is to me much more powerful than than just throwing a bunch of crap together and creating a uh, a one 
one shot wonder hero stuff like that like so like my hero academia i like it is it my favorite no is it and i know uh fusor doc's gonna give me some crap uh for that one <laughs> um because he pretty much leaves the lit uh breeds that stuff um but I think that when we have to talk about a heroic journey is it's really what you make it out to be within it. So some stuff is really, really great. Some of it is just, just crap. Like there's an anime that's out there. Let's just call like the song of the whales or something like that. And you totally can guess what's happening in the first couple episodes and everything like that. And by the end of it, it's like, gosh, guys, like, this is just an anime that is just talking about all these depressing things. And while that's appropriate and stuff, it doesn't have a true storyline. It doesn't have a true great thing. And I think that's what it's, what it's kind of uh, one of the ones I, um, I probably will not so, watch that second season at all. Is it, so so you, you're saying that there are opportunities out there for people to try and do this, the hero, the hero theme and completely swing and miss. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like for the that song of the whale one, it's it focused on a, an emotional boy um, who is trying to figure out why these things are happening. And he's he's writing. He's like a historian, and they're they're trying to do this weird historian perspective um, from it, and being able to to go forward and show that what he has historically documented. Now, I have to say, I. I totally lost interest four episodes in and i was already there and i'm like i gotta finish this i don't want to but like (laughs) if it gets to a point where it's like super super um i'm watching food for a doc right now yell at me (laughs) like (laughs) like we we did that um and i when when we when we look at that 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 one itself it's just it's just a terrible anime I, i don't know why people watch it it's just terrible uh sailor moon had it was way better than, than that one and like super super powerful because it's the the teamwork the cohesion the social ability the social cohesion i mean that's that's really what draws a lot of people together it's not always about one one character but who are the stragglers that are picked up along the way the ragtag group of followers that come yeah. with the hero oftentimes and most of the time let's be honest the 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 ragtag group they're the comic relief yeah. They're the ones that are there to, to they're, they're the ones in act two that have the, 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 the innkeeper song from Les Mis, you know, they're the ones that, <laughs> that, that they're, they're just to lighten the load a little bit so that you can keep trudging through, uh, you know, after, uh, after all the bad stuff keeps happening, you can go back to them for a quick laugh. Yeah, absolutely. They're they're always there to to release the the heavy tensions. Now, like Black Clover, I'm really enjoying that one. I've only seen the first season, but uh, that one is super super interesting because it has a, an absolute. It has every of the of the characters within the the main storyline of uh, the Black Bulls and uh, the uh, the Eagles. I think are the other ones. Um, has but it primarily focuses on uh, uh, Asta um, in the Black Bulls and within that one each one has their own story arc found within asta's story arc um as well and so they're all coming into their own because the black bulls is kind of like the the mages guild that's just like where the the wannabe mages go that the useful useless ones go but the the whole problem is that asta is is uh i'm going to use the word blessed with the idea of uh the fifth black clover where it's um he's like in charge of like the demon uh, sorcery in itself. And he doesn't realize it yet because he actually has no magical powers, uh, but everyone else does. And so his, his best friend and um, that he grew up with um, actually had is like supreme magically gifted. And Asta had to save him at one point and vice versa. And so he promised Asta that he'd never be weak again. And so it's a really interesting dyad that they have together. But I think one of the, the aspects that they, they keep on pushing through forward is when they've reached their limits, they're, they're commanders, they're the leads of these uh, houses, the bull, house of bulls or whatever it is, um, black bulls, then they tell them, surpass your limits, go farther than what you have. And Asta is actually the one that encourages that and forces that to happen around people around him. So it's not necessarily just 
about what are they doing, but how are they interacting with the people around them? How are they making people grow with them? In a sense, how do we push our boundaries? How do we push our limits in that, that aspect? And that, that's really in, in, in a perfect world, the, the idea of what, what uh, another aspect of the hero can be is it's not just bettering yourself, but bettering the people around you. Mm -hmm. Uh, helping to, to bring change when it's needed. Mm -hmm. And to push past our, push past our limits a bit too. Because we all have our limits, we think that's where our ceiling is, but it's super important to to push past that and to to see what we can do going forward. Now that's one thing that I always loved is uh, the idea of the hero isn't necessarily about – it's never really about keeping the status quo. You know, it's a, a lot mm -hmm. of times it's about uh, 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 creating change in societies where it's absolutely necessary. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't rise up until something happens that takes us out of that comfort zone. And mm -hmm. we need that hero to really push us forward. You know, um, I mean, obviously, this week a lot of bad stuff has happened in uh, in Minneapolis, for example. Mm -hmm. There's, 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 there's absolutely things in this country that need to be addressed. You know, there are actions and there's behaviors that are absolutely unacceptable, and things are gonna change. And hopefully, I mean, hopefully we, we, we obviously have heroes in this country and we have people that want uh, the best for everyone. And I hope we, uh, we have those, those people um, ready and available to really stand up and start talking and, and making sure that they're heard. So even yeah. in real life, not just in escapism, people, <laughs> we need them in real life too. We, we sure do. And, and the people who are trying to, uh, thrust themselves into uh the heroes of uh uh viewpoint um <clears throat> president um and stuff all along those lines not to make this political um but the uh the idea is that that's what we call the uh, the anti a, a, a villain in a sense is someone who tries to force their opinion and say i'm right you're wrong i'm big you're small matilda style is is actually um playing a villain role you know what's great is is looking at that just that descriptor that you gave like uh, a couple a few weeks ago four weeks ago now uh, I did the show with with uh, with Ryan and we talked about Death Note and um, oh gosh now I can't think of his name the guy, L oh, no not L the the I can't think of his name the the character that actually has the the Death Note the the, the notebook uh, I can't think of his name to save my mm -hmm. life but anyway. He's absolutely that because in the in the initial in the initial few episodes he says you know I'm going to change the world I'm going to take these bad people out I'm going to do something light thank you thank yes. you shrink wandering shrink um, yeah he you know he's got the mindset of I'm going to change the world I'm going to make things better I'm going and then he just completely loses it yeah so, that's that's the the danger of the power in a sense if you can't keep your going to go back to Zelda. Um, if, you, if you can't have the wisdom or the courage to use your wisdom appropriately, you can't uh, utilize your power adequately. And if you can't do that, then power runs rampant. You are absolutely ready to sell those books. Oh my God. <laughs> that, that one's last year. We're, yeah. we're, I mean, we're doing uh, the Final Fantasy one now. That, that's oh. the one we're we're pushing that's coming out in August, and it actually it, it actually has like surpassing your limit break in the title, which is really funny. Yeah, um, I I love I loved the Final Fantasy series, and I still do. Um, uh, I did the the show with uh, with Doctor Rachel about Final Fantasy VI, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's she's in love with that one. Man. I am too. I am not gonna lie, I am too. That's actually <laughs> the funny thing is, is that's actually how she and I really uh, became friends, um, because she had found me for some art for Clinical Role, and we started talking. And as I was, you know, sending her uh, updates on the artwork for the, uh, the the big poster that I did for them, uh, I started showing her a couple other things. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, you know, here, oh here's a fun little thing I did about Final Fantasy. She's like, wait, what? Final Fantasy? Which one? I'm like six and she's like what yeah <laughs> what you, you get her talking about six she won't be quiet for oh, like yeah. hours it's we we, be, we became fast friends after that yeah um and then and then actually yeah that's how i ended up uh, uh talking with you guys the first time about the uh, the pax east panel uh, i'm sending some art, art, art your guys's way so uh, i was very very fortunate very glad that that uh, that whole relationship started 
with something as as innocuous as me saying, "Hey, check this out. This is something I drew just for fun." <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of the the greatest things that I think it just shows even that how that those types of collaborations just come together yeah. through a, a, a very specific medium. Oh, I'm running out of time. I gotta get I gotta get highlights on these guys. <laughs> I think it looks great. I gotta get highlights on them. I got the shadow. I think I got. I'm finishing up the shadows right now. But I gotta get highlights on them, and then this we can call this thing done. Maybe get a little bit of background uh, action going. <laughs> but I gotta get. I gotta get that. I gotta get the highlights on. I got. I got 17 minutes here, folks. Four, oh no, 16. Ah. Oh no, time's running out. Your time's time. running out. Uh, okay. <laughs> So while I'm focusing on this, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to kind of turn things over to you. I still want to talk about I want to talk about I like heroes. Let's talk about heroes. Everyone yeah. out there uh uh everyone in the, in the in the chat, who are your favorite heroes? Who 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 are the heroes in in the stories, in books, in movies, in video games, in anime, TV shows, whatever? Who are the heroes that have spoken to you the most and why? You know what, what? Why do you do you relate to them? Why do they speak to you? Why do they encourage you? And you can't use Link. You can't yeah, use Link. Fusro Doc, you can't use Link. Ooh, Wandering Shrink says that she's a villain person. Nope. What? Who's the villains? All right. Who are the villains here? I, I'll be honest. There's actually a show of this I want to do. I think I want to do it with Dr. Ryan again, uh, where we uh, talk about like Disney villains. I think that would oh, be yeah. a fun show to do. I'm, I'm actually going to be on a, a podcast in on Monday about uh, villains and stuff like that. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah? Gonna be, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Um, villains and, like, villainry and <laughs> why we like them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about think about uh, some of the remakes that they that we've seen. I mean, and the whole concept of the book of the book in the show Wicked. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, the the movie Maleficent that came out. I mean, absolutely. You know, there's something about these characters that that we love and that we relate to that we want to see them portrayed as heroes. Absolutely, we want to we want to see that, and we we want to experience that connection to them. But why, when we know that, well, from one point of view, as Obi Wan would say, from a certain point of view, they're they're bad guys. You know, why do we want to know? I mean, is it is it is it is it something about that that's well, I mean, just like for with the, us to know with the, what with the hero? Me? We can relate to the villain as well. We can relate to aspects of it because we're we're drawn to it. I mean, the it's, it's like a, a the idea of the villain is a, a, a death drive almost. Like it's a, a destruction. Um, but here's the thing: is out of the destruction comes creation. You can't create something without destroying something else. You can't uh, create a, a wedding ring without destroying the the ore. You can't create a house without destroying a forest. That that's the type of idea uh, behind it. And so, the idea of of destruction is is a realistic uh, possibility in our world. But it's also something that we we have to realize relate to and kind of go forward with and i think it's why we like villains so, so much sometimes let me ask you this was thanos a hero or a villain um i think that he could have been a hero and he done certain things in a different way now had he gotten the stones and replaced everybody that he killed there had been a lot of ptsd but had he gotten the stones and just created an infinite stockpile of resources, that could have been done as well. There's a lot of other ways that it could have been, could have uh, happened. I think where in his eyes, because of his his background, his nature, that that's what kind of created him in, indefinitely into who he was. And he saw it from a very one-sided point of view that if he he went down this this path and there was no other way, way that would actually um, go forward with it. He wasn't sure. able to think outside of his box, which is why he had that that villain mentality. He could only see one path forward when there's lots of different ways to do it. He was methodical, cunning, and thinking, uh, also very strong, but he didn't think outside of that box. He decided to put himself into. Yeah, when I watched when I watched Infinity War for the first time, I I, I sat there for a moment. I'm like this this. This isn't an Avengers movie. This is this is a Thanos movie. Yep. I mean, this is absolutely all about him. I mean, and I get why they did that. I absolutely do because I mean, they had they had built him up for so long, and he really hadn't had any screen time. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he he was this this giant uh, um, 
uh, lingering uh, force out in the out in the out in the ether, you know, that was just kind of waiting to to come and and take over or come and, and destroy or do something. Uh, but we really didn't know who he was. He didn't have a personality yet. So I loved that that they did that. Uh, with Thanos in, in uh, Infinity War, I love that they that they basically made it a movie all about him and where he came from and what he's about, and and where he made, they made him relatable. Yeah. Because he, oh, yeah. As, as soon as as soon as like the whole thing idea was like we're gonna take out half the population, you saw memes galore come out of nowhere, being like. When, when the villain's uh, plan and theory actually makes sense and you, you can actually be like, hmm, that wouldn't be bad. And the guy was yeah. like, oh, no, I can see the villain's point of view and I can relate to this. Like that, that was kind of one of the things that, that drew a lot of people in is that it's not just the, the idea of destruction for the sake of destruction. There's a purpose behind it. Yeah. What's, what's funny, though, is that they kind of took that away in Endgame. Like the way – I mean it, he, he was – what? five seven years younger than we see him in infinity war or something like that um and so he may have had a different little bit of a different personality it, to me it seemed like in infinity war he was a lot he was a little bit softer uh as a character do you know what i mean and, and, and in mm-hmm. endgame he was he was much harder very hard lined about what he wanted where he was going and he was it was all about the uh inevitable um Huh, that's a good word too. All paths uh, lead to him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was that, it was that, uh, that, that, that physical interaction that they want, that everyone wanted to see. You know what I mean? They, everyone wanted to see the real fight between him and the Avengers and stuff. And I feel like they kind of forced that a little bit because I, well, I, if we, if we look at what he was doing, if, if he, if he had those extra five to ten years to think about what he was doing, then there's a different aspect. He also lost a few of his people mm-hmm. along the ways uh, at that point where he hadn't uh, it in, in uh, end game and he came back. He also saw everything within his grasp where he did. He like, he was in end game. Technically when he comes from the, the past, he was still searching for those stones. Yep. So he didn't, they weren't all within his grasp. So he saw everything within his grasp and he refused, let's say the villain's journey. And oh, was that another of, chapter? <laughs> it should be is that, is um, that the next book <laughs> that'll probably be something else that we'll, we'll do uh, down the line here and there but w- when we when we look at that and we look at where he was he skipped major portions of his development and in and, and just saw the prize at the end of it mm-hmm. and just impulsively went for it and i think that's where we saw him more hardline more cool and less calculating because he was very impulsive and just trying to get to where he was instead of calculating through the rest of the the entire arc of the, the movies not just the movie arcs individual sure. ones but the overall arc of the entire avengers and marvel series see this is what this is what you you come here for anime and a little illustration and you get bird walks that's what you get here for <laughs> but i'm okay we, with it we're calling them cake walks cake walks point. now i want cake <laughs> i uh i'm i'm it still kind of fits in with the whole idea of the hero because, like, like mm-hmm. I said, there was absolutely part of Thanos at one point because you said he's relatable. You see what he's trying to get. He's not just uh, a, a psychopath. He's just not just trying to just. He's not trying to destroy for the sake of destruction. He has an end goal. You know, he there's there's, you know, that he wants to make the the universe sustainable. He wants to make it livable. You know, so that, that that's that's the only reason why I even brought him up with this whole idea of uh, the hero and all that. So, I mean, it, that, that's that's the important part is that the just they like with it. the yeah with the heroes that we we see the grittiness and the the different aspects of it, we also start seeing the the villains that we can kind of relate to. And there's movies out there where we're like, uh, you know, like uh, let's go with what is it. Um, it's not the Fast and the Furious, but what is that that one that they came out with? Um, Hobbs and Shaw. That's it. Okay. That's it. Like that one, the villain uh, was not relatable at all. It was just an overpowered guy who was looking for like biomechanically uh, doing his body. And I was like, well, all right, this is cool to watch, but I don't relate to this villain on any level. Yeah. Um, and in Hobbs and Shaw, I mean, that was just. I wouldn't pay money for that, but it was a, it was a wonderful uh, movie to watch on date night with the wife. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a it was a popcorn flick. It's just yeah. it's, it's it's two and a half hours of things blowing up. 
and uh, people dressed in uh, Samoa gear and defeating an entire army with guns and rocket launchers with old nineteen early nineteen hundred uh, weaponry. And you're like, hmm, really? Don't know how this how this works like this because we just stand a fire, we just shoot you all down, and it's done. <laughs> Not that hard, guys. We're gonna have a couple of these shows where we just pick apart movies. <laughs> we just destroy them. Um, it's it's, it's like going to be instead sense. of Adam ruins everything, it's going to be Randall destroys your favorite thing. Uh, this is ice this cream. Is... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but fat. Oh. <laughs> no one likes Rocky Road. Who wants peanuts in their ice cream? Oh man, I miss peanuts so much. My kids have peanut allergies. I miss peanuts. Oh man, I would miss them too. I can't tell you the last time I had peanut butter. <laughs> I had it yesterday. You can be jealous. No, oh, I see that face. <laughs> Say goodbye to Dr. Anthony, everybody. <laughs> and stream done. And stream five done. minutes early. <laughs> I got five minutes left. Okay, I might be able to. I might be able to throw in a little bit of a of quasi background to this guy. All right, we got we got five minutes. We can do a background. Let's do. Wait, where's he at? Where's it at? There it is. Um, let's get the blue. Oh, that's really good. We're going to have some fun with this. It's almost like a, a samurai shampoo style of, of, of artwork, too, in there. I like it. Another anime that I haven't seen. <laughs> it's uh, I, it, it's kind of like uh, Samurai X. It's the gritty, uh, gritty version of uh, Riona Kenshin. Okay. Uh, much more grittier, like Japanese version and... Uh, destruction and death and blood and guts <laughs> let's just say the first like five minutes of uh, samurai x they uh pretty much like show him so the assassins attacking attacking uh the samurai and the samurai just like easily destroying them and someone sends like a, a a cleaver towards him and he just turns around catches the cleaver midair and just slices the guy right in half uh, long ways and you're like Wow. Okay, I know what this. Uh, we know this, this is going to happen out. now. Yeah. Well, death and destruction. <laughs> All right. Well, I tell you what, folks. I think we. I think we created something here. I think we had uh, some uh, some fun conversation. I think we got a cool little uh, illustration out of it. That's really um, neat. So, and, and again, it kind of plays on the whole yin yang thing with vicious mm -hmm. and and, uh, and spike here. So that's a uh, that's fun to see too. Um. Everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Anthony Bean, why don't you tell everyone uh, that's watching where they can find you online, what are you doing, and, uh, and what to look forward to. Absolutely. So they can find me online. Twitter is at uh, Video Game Doc. I uh, help run the Geek Therapy Training, uh, geektherapytraining.com. We do all sorts of cool stuff where we train everyone in that. Uh, we do books at Leyline Publishing, which we have our Final Fantasy one coming out in August, which is going to be phenomenal. And um, yeah, I mean, you can find me online. I'm pretty much doing all sorts of stuff. And we have tons of books that we do, articles. And we're, so we're pretty much at the PAXs when they run. <laughs> yeah, if, if the there other are thing. PAXs. Yeah, if they are. All right. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate you coming and uh, talking with me about this show. I am a fan now, so you've 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 got another convert. We've converted. Yeah. No. This is this has been a, this has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed uh, the show. I re really enjoyed talking to you about it. Thanks so much. Uh, for everyone that doesn't know, my name is Randall Hampton. I am the author and illustrator of the Little Game Master series of children's books that are basically Dr. Seuss meets Dungeons and Dragons. We will be back here every uh, every other Friday. Uh, looking at uh, different types of, um, uh, uh, of IPs and pop culture and things like that. Uh, so come back in two weeks. We're going to be talking about Harry Potter. Ooh, that's going to be a good one. So, yes, uh, come and uh, hang out with us uh, in two weeks. Go check out our Discord. Um, Geeks Like Us, we have, a, we have some Discord. If I could get some, of the, some people to throw that, uh, throw that up there, that'd be great. Uh, go check out our Discord. Come and uh, be part of the conversation of all things geeky. Uh, we'd love to have you there. Um, stay tuned. Uh, later on today, we're going to have some more stuff uh, coming up. Um, uh, I think, is it Retro Pro Gamer is coming up? Uh, Fusro Doc, is that what it is? 
What's going on? What's coming up next? There it is. Oh, cool. Very good. Um, but yeah, so lots of stuff coming up. So stay tuned uh, if you if you get uh, if you get some some time on your hands. Uh, we really appreciate your time hanging out with us. Retro Nathan, that's what it is. <laughs> You're I, knew it was retro, it. I knew it was retro something. Uh, retro Nathan's coming up at four thirty, and then uh, Pro Social Gamer. Did they uh, are Pro Social? Are they on for tonight or no? I think they were up in the air. They may be doing something other than uh, what they've been doing because. Uh, because the game is out of beta. They are still going. Okay, cool. So Pro Social Gaming tonight. Uh, at, I think it's at like 9. Oh, they're doing Jackbox. Oh, fun. Good deal. It's All super right. fun. Everyone, thank you so much uh, for hanging out with us. Uh, and I will keep a, keep a, an eye out for all of us. Uh, at Randall Hampton on uh, underscore Hampton at, uh, on Twitter. Uh, and we're here all the time, basically. So have a, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you next time.